Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, thank you. Here's the other challenge, besides you guys being a little inactive at the first, is I don't do PowerPoints. Like, I use the excuse that um, just a verbal presentation is a low carbon way of speaking, but the truth is I hate them because I have to use this, which I have no idea how to use, but I'm gonna, I, I did a PowerPoint for you. Don't judge it, there's mistakes, you can look for them. If you find them, you can tell me about it later. Um, but I'll screw this up so we can kind of laugh together. So first of all, it's an absolute honor to be here. Difficult to follow Bill, of course. Uh, you know, he is just an amazing leader. And he's already given you a little bit of the substance that I'll touch on, but I'll, I'll probably build upon it. Um, I lived here, as Tracy said, in South Africa in the early 90s. And um, our foundation still does work here in South Africa. We fund a number of um, the organizations that have helped make um, this conference happen and a few others that I see in the room. And we're really proud to be um, supporting the civil society organizations in South Africa. Um, so let's be really clear that the threats imposed by the climate emergency are as clear as the science. Food system collapse, drought, fires, extreme weather events will impact those most who had the least to do with the crisis. And I'm not saying anything you don't know and that isn't already profound, but the world must trans transition off of fossil fuels and rapidly embrace renewable energy to avoid more catastrophic impacts than we're already seeing that will wreak havoc on human rights around the world and life-supporting ecosystems. So the climate crisis can seem completely overwhelming. How can the average person affect systemic change on an issue that's so profound? It's a question that people of conscience asked decades ago all around the world, witnessing the abuses of the apartheid regime of South Africa. Activists then and activists now understood that we could influence the flow of money and weaken those that would benefit, those in power who would benefit from the abuses of human rights. We had the power to move our retirement accounts, our banks, our faith groups, our university endowments to shift their investments out of the offending companies and ultimately into those committed to solutions. The modern day climate movement took a page out of the anti-apartheid uh, playbook to combat climate change and launched this global fossil fuel divestment campaign. As Bill said, arguing it was no longer acceptable to invest in, and let's be clear, therefore own the companies who were knowingly imperiling our planet and its life support systems. And also learning the lessons of the past, the activists understood and increasingly understand that it's not enough to renounce those who profit from this abuse and degradation, but we must also deploy capital to create an economy that is viable, sustainable, and rights respecting for all. And I'll come back to that. I'm gonna tell you a little bit the, about the journey our foundation took um, that led us into uh, divesting our own assets from fossil fuels, investing in climate solutions, and supporting the fossil fuel divestment movement. Now here's my first test, let's see how I do. Yay, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> if you only knew, if my 20-something if my child saw that, she'd be crying laughing, because usually I just hand her any means of technology like this, and she's like, oh God, Mom. Um, so our foundation started championing the fossil fuel divestment movement back in 2009, 2010, and supporting work on divestment. When we began divesting our own endowment from fossil fuels, then supporting the nascent and burgeoning student movement calling for investors to withdraw from the coal industry, then oil and gas sectors. We began first by tackling our investment portfolio. It was, we're a very progressive foundation. We work on environment and human rights issues. And we knew it was not okay to be invested in industries that were driving the crisis and, um, and then with the vast share of our assets 
And then with a tiny sliver of that, our grants, our 5% or 6%, now a lot more, which I can tell you about later, um, in, we're asking with our grants, grantees to solve the crisis we're driving by being invested in the companies driving the problem. It was an absolutely unacceptable contradiction to us. And we understood that if we owned fossil fuels, we actually owned climate change. It was a moral imperative, as Bill said, first and foremost. That was our primary motivation, to develop social and environmental um, change filters to our investments. So we hired in, uh, consultants, we beefed up our investment committee, and then as we went down this journey and we were like, are we gonna dabble in mission aligned investing or are we going whole hog? We decided to go 100% mission aligned. And we said, we'll be totally transparent about it publicly so that even if we lose our shirts, we are a case study for others to see and to um, evaluate. So that's what we did. So why fossil fuel divestment? Bill gave you already some of the background of the movement. We began supporting the very first student campaign. Student youth campaigners have always been the engine of social change worldwide, and they are the engine of this growing global movement, the climate movement. They, with the early divestment work, stressing the immorality of investing in the fossil fuel under, industry that was undermining their future. Some argued we had a responsibility instead to invest as well, but in the very first campaigns, there were few campuses that did fossil fuel divestment, a few that did coal, and a few that led with invest and then divest. Eight campuses went to 40 overnight, and then do the math happened. And when do the math happened, it was like a match had been lit. And pretty soon, within, I'd say, six months, 40 campuses went to 400 across the United States and then started expanding um, in, you know, across and into Europe. I won't go, you've, we've, you've already heard a little bit about, from Bill, about the history of 350's role and from Alex, but it's important to realize that the article that Bill published in Rolling Stone connected the divestment concept with the idea of the carbon bubble and stranded asset risk to investors. Basically, the idea was that the fossil fuel companies had way more reserves of fossil fuels than they could ever burn and, and keep the planet below two degrees Celsius warming. We know now that's not enough. It needs to be one and a half um, urgently. But the, uh, that, was, that analysis was produced by an organization called the Carbon Tracker Initiative. And I say this everywhere I go in hopes that someday someone from the Nobel uh, organization will hear me say that Mark Campanelli deserves a Nobel Prize for economics more than anyone. <laughs> but if you're on the committee, let me know. Um, OK. So. Uh, the, what slide am I on? I have no idea. See, I told you it's already happening. This is a, um, from a quote from the article, The Terrifying New Math, that was published in um, Rolling Stone. Now this is just a historic relic. It's from a presentation that I gave at the very first student convergence at Swarthmore about actually our foundation and many of the groups that we were supporting thinking about the theory of change behind the fossil fuel divestment movement. And basically, I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but think about this. The fossil fuel industry was the barrier to getting progress on climate change, full stop. The Copenhagen Climate Conference failed. Efforts to get policy passed in the US failed. Why? Because while foundations like mine poured tens of millions into promoting the science of climate change and supporting policy organizing, the industry was putting tens of millions more into disinformation about the science, into buying off politicians to make sure that they uh, would not act on that science. And so the real problem was foundations like mine were busing students down to Washington, D.C. to lobby for public policy du jour. Let me say failed public policy du jour. Whereas there was this tool, finance, social finance, frankly, that we have access to because we invest. We invest in institutions we belong to invest. 
And with a hefty bit of activism, you can move those investment funds on a moral imperative. So failure of policy, misplaced advocacy, industry disinformation, and now the youth start focusing on divestment. So why divestment? Divestment's a tool that any of us can use, but together can leverage really significant financial power. It's replicable if the students started at campuses, calling on their universities. It's replicable to other sectors, faith, um, pension funds, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll come back to philanthropy. And social finance is already a proven lever of change. It's why it's so significant that we're here today in South Africa, in Cape Town. So it was clear as well that our sector, philanthropy, had to be pressured into divestment. And so I knew that um, the activists could not call on their funders to divest and still expect to get funding. So I created, along with uh, some partners, something called Divest Invest Philanthropy. And we called on our sector to get their assets out of fossil fuels and invest at least 5% of their portfolios in the solutions. Today, we have close to 200 foundations around the world that have committed. Now, I'm not going to lie. It hasn't been an easy journey. And just... Um, it was frustrating, quite frankly, at first, because to me it was obvious. The point of di committing to divest invest for foundations was not for self-aggrandizement. It was to get out and put wind at the back of the student movement, to put our portfolios up and show that it can be done, and to drive the market for fossil-free products. We needed a sector to come out fast with social legitimacy and help to move the market. It was a grind. We had 17 foundations, then another 55, and that cohort was led by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. I do want to correct something Bill said. It was the Rockefeller Brothers Fund that committed to divest, not, not the family itself, but that foundation is led by fam, family members. It's just an important caveat. So as you'll see, um, a, a really joyous moment was when Civicus launched a new award for brave philanthropy and they gave the inaugural award, the Nelson Mandela Grasso Michelle Award to Divest Invest Philanthropy. Um, we'll come back to philanthropy if we can. So the, um, the movement was organizing and growing really rapidly in a very short period of time. And new organizations were getting in behind 350, getting in behind the movement and saying, I'll run this in my sector. Like we created Divest Invest Philanthropy for philanthropy. Green Faith got in behind the faith sector. Um, a new organization was formed, the Global Catholic Climate Movement, to start moving the Catholic sector on divestment. Groups around Europe and groups around the Global South began to embrace divestment, often in partnership with 350, but bringing their own special sauce and their own constituencies to the fight. Five years ago this month, we had the first global divestment announcement. At that time, we announced that $52 billion in assets under management had been committed to some form of fossil fuel divestment. That was done the day after the Cli People's Climate March and the day before Ban Ki-moon's Climate Summit. So I get the joy of telling you that at the fifth anniversary of that announcement, in 25 minutes, there'll be another announcement. And there's a press conference happening in this building. And today, the announcement will be that we've reached 11 trillion in assets under management committed to some form of divestment. <laughs> Give yourselves applause. For those of you that have been for those of you that have been fighting this fight, this is absolutely stunning. No one thought that we could reach this level. And I think, David, did you do the, do the math? <laughs> did you do the math that that's 1 16th of public? 16% of 16 equities, according to the World Bank. Wow. 16% of public equities, according to the World Bank. That's real money, folks. That's moving substantial um, assets. So the reason for this really rapid growth is, is, um, there's, is multiple. 
First, it was very clear that there is a moral imperative. We are all global citizens, and every institution <laughs> has a responsibility at this moment to take action on climate change. No one escapes global responsibility for infusing climate change into the operations of your institution. For um, charities and for not-for-profit institutions, including foundations, you receive charitable tax status to serve the public good. If your investments are arguably undercutting the public good, you have moral, ethical, and ultimately fiduciary responsibility to divest. Because your fiduciary duty as a not-for-profit is to the mission first and foremost. And obviously climate change impacts the mission of virtually every nonprofit or charitable institution. Okay, I wanna kind of move along because Bill gave you a nice history. So 2014, first announcement. This is why you start to see the movement exploding. These are the reasons to divest, and I'll come back to the fiduciary. But then you start to see strong linkages coming between the divestment movement, the people like Steve Kretzman, who have worked for decades to keep it in the ground and to end fossil fuel subsidies. You start seeing other strategies connecting together with the divestment movement, all focused on the fossil fuel industry. And then an explosion of litigation all around the world, calling on um, governments to take action and also targeting the fossil fuel directly for damages. Um, and campaigns calling on politicians not to take any money from the fossil fuel industry. And finally, um, stopping the financing and underwriting of fossil fuel projects. I would add another interesting historic piece that as we get up closer to today, the very first students that organized divestment campaigns in the United States formed something called uh, the Sunrise Movement. And they are the ones that developed the concept of the Green New Deal and the advocacy for the Green New Deal, which is just exploding in the United States. And even globally, Green New Deal advocacy is now taking off worldwide. OK, so last year in whatever year that was, because I can't remember, <laughs> at um, a, the San Francisco Climate Summit, the network of organizations working on divestment announced that we had crossed a 7.1 trillion threshold one year ago, it's 11 trillion today, and said we would, we would, we called on investors to divest 10 trillion by 2020, and now to start getting serious about the invest side of the equation, that we have to scale the solutions rapidly so that we can get off of fossil fuels. And I'm gonna spend most of the remainder of my talk focusing on that. Um, but I do want to, uh, Bill's already touched on this. I do wanna share this chart. I did not put this chart together, nor could I even figure out how to put that red mark around it. So you can see it's kind of off, it's not aligned. I told you I'm not good at this. What is this? This is the performance of the major financial sectors since 2015, last five years. Take a look at the red one. It is the lowest performing sector, bar none, at the level of treasuries. This is the fossil fuel sector. Now, we need to divest for ethical reasons, but this tells you, if you're invested in coal, well, what is wrong with you? And if you're investing in all fossil fuels, you're losing your shirt. So, and it's not gonna get better. It's not coming back. If you look at the, the history of the internal combustion engine and how it replaced um, the horse and buggy in a matter of five years, you understand that technology disruption can happen very, very quickly. And so you don't want to be trying to time the market at this point when the indicators are already pretty clear that these are bad investments. Now here are three portfolios managed by our investment advisors, and these are their returns over the last five years, three portfolios. 
My foundation has beat its benchmark since we began divesting by, by 2% every year um, since we got out of fossil fuels. We are also 16% invested in climate solutions with a 5% carve out for highly transformative impact investments where we're willing to accept a lower the market rate of return. In 2017, we did 21.6% returns. I sat down with my board and I said, in a moment of the climate emergency and in a crisis of American democracy, democracy worldwide, it was not okay to grow our endowment. We took all of our end of year uh, performance, what we were up at the end of the year, and we put it into grants for the next year. We doubled our grant budget. We put an extra 10 million into grants. So um, we have not suffered from divesting from fossil fuels, nor investing in climate solutions. As I said, we're 16% invested in climate solutions. Okay, so let's talk about investing in climate solutions. We need to capitalize this sector. And uh, an organization um, that you know of, probably some of you know of Ceres, um, estimated that we need a clean trillion in investments annually to scale the solutions in time to keep the planet. Their clean trillion was calculated with a two degree scenario. We know now that's not adequate. It has to be 1.5. So what that, their first recommendation was that every single investor must put 5% into climate solutions, every investor, or we will not scale the solutions in time. But I think we have to think about how we do that and that as we do that, we also have to demand that the renewable sector respects human rights and respects environmental standards as well. It's not a given that just because it's a business that creates renewable energy that it's going to be a kumbaya fabulous business, right? So our foundation is doing some work on creating standards for the renewable sector, human rights and environmental standards. But I would also challenge us, particularly for mission-driven investors, that we have to think really carefully about what the energy transition looks like. <coughs> Most investments are going to go to large-scale renewables that will be in capital cities and will probably be privately owned and accumulate wealth. But we're in the middle of an energy transition, profound. When you think about the energy base of the economy transforming, it is profound change, right? We could go from a fossil fuel economy to a renewable economy and leave a billion people without access to electricity today behind. There's no inevitability that the energy transition will reach the billion that don't have it today. The billion that can't get access to electricity today through heavy fossil fuel grid in infrastructure. But we have the technology today to leapfrog fossil fuels and reach the people in the last kilometer, the last mile. So I think we have to be really committed to leaving no one behind. We also have to invest in extractive workers and their communities, the just transition. It is not the workers' fault that the climate crisis happened. And we have to make sure that they, those communities are supported, those workers are taken care of, retrained where possible for other jobs. So opportunity for new models of community ownership in energy access, for instance, distributed off-grid energy, small energy infrastructure. And we need to make rapid investments in the global south and in the frontline communities and in places like the United States. Here's a little bit about us, and I'm gonna focus on these. We, I told you we put about 5% of our portfolio towards highly transformative impact investments. And that led us to two areas of work and a very important investment that I'll tell you about. We started funding this analysis and field building around a gender lens on investing. That is making sure that women's rights are incorporated into company practices and in their supply chains. And that investors need to have a perspective on women's rights. So gender and women's rights is an important part of our impact investing alongside energy and energy poverty. And here, Tracy mentioned, We've helped launch something called SHINE. It's a coalition of faith-based 
mission investors, development organizations, women's organizations, and philanthropies committed to reaching that billion, saying we actually could eliminate energy poverty in our lifetime. And it would not be difficult to do. It requires money, collaboration, and political will. So please look up Shine if this is something you want to be involved in. But this is part of investing in the solutions and investing in a way that is really transformative. And then next, we made a commitment to help the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe build a wind farm. When the Dakota Access Pipeline fight began, which reverberated across the world, I learned that the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe had been in early stages of planning a wind farm, grid scale wind farm, that would bring revenue to the tribe and create jobs for the tribe. They had to put it on hold when they defended their lands against the pipeline. So we've helped them start to um, build the wind farm and to attract investors. And to me, I bring this up because I think this is a model of what philanthropy can be doing, but not just philanthropy. This is actually going to bring market returns. We may not accept market returns, my foundation, but it will bring market returns to the investors, and it will be owned by the tribe. And so they need investors to get in behind them, but they will control the um, wind farm. These are the examples we need to be thinking about when we think about investing in climate solutions and transforming our society as we do so. Okay, I only think I have a couple more slides, maybe even one, which makes me really happy. It's the last one. Okay, so my foundation, I'll be totally transparent, over the last 10 years has spent about $10 million in grants supporting the fossil fuel divestment movement and corollary advocacy around it, about a million a year. And today, the movement has moved $11 trillion in assets. We've made about 165 grants. At the same time, we've um, modeled the divest invest call to action, and it's been pretty successful for us financially. But here's what I want you to think about. <laughs> Institutions that divest have a strong, have a strong ethical, financial imperative to do so. I, we can come back and talk about this. But most significantly, institutional investors who don't divest are morally and financially derelict and potentially at risk for failing in your fiduciary duty because you are on notice that you have climate risks in your portfolio. And if you are not acting on them and lose in a, a portion of your investments, then you are at risk of failing in your fiduciary duty for not acting sooner. And it is this combination of ethical, financial, and fiduciary imperatives that have really fueled this movement and will continue to fuel it. It's why it's grown so significantly. But it has not focused sufficiently on the invest side. And I know we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. The fossil fuel industry is not going to change its stripes. Years of shareholder engagement, and we do shareholder engagement with many other industries. We believe in shareholder engagement. Years of shareholder engagement with the fossil fuel companies has more than borne this out. They continue to pursue growth strategy that will blow the roof off the Paris Agreement and expand fossil fuel production in infrastructure, spending billions of dollars to do it, while they continue to spend millions quietly or indirectly now lobbying against climate pro progress. They do it through their front groups if they're not doing it directly. And they continue to sow disinformation about the science and the solutions needed to solve our common emergency while they market the fraction of their assets that go into greener solutions. They spend more on the marketing of those greener solutions than they do on the solutions themselves. Check out Influence Map's analysis of that. So don't be deceived that your engagement is going to produce 1.5 business plans from ExxonMobil. In the, in the history of the world, there are moments where we have to decide which side are you on. 
As climate change barrels down on us, the choice is crystal clear. It's long since time to divest. Money is power, as Tracy said, and we can leverage capital to avert catastrophe and power change that benefits all of us. Thank you.